Okay, so we're gonna move on to game 11. And before we do, here's my uh, standard uh, uh, thing that I like to do. And um, we'll just get that set up for you. So every day, as you guys know who have been following me for a while uh, through this World Chess Championship, uh, every day I like to go over a little bit of the history of the Linear World Chess Championship. And I've been using this as my background at times. This is every Linear World Chess Champion in history. Going back to Wilhelm Steinitz, I've also included, you might notice a couple of uh, uh, sketches or whatever composites of Philidor, and also a photograph of Paul Morphy, who were clearly the best in the world for their era. But all of the Linear World Chess Champions are on this picture, and I've been talking a little bit about them as we lead up towards um, the current World Chess Championship, and it all started in 1866 with Wilhelm Steinitz as he beat um, Adolf Anderson in a match. At the time, they were both considered the two greatest chess players in the world, with the exception of Paul Morphy, who by then had retired. For certain, by the time that uh, Steinitz played Zuckertort in 1886, it was 100% certain, and it was even included as a clause in the contract, that this was for the World Chess Championship. So Steinitz, the very first linear world chess champion, he was beaten by Emmanuel Lasker, who was beaten by Jose Raul Capablanca of Cuba, who was beaten by Alexander Alakine of France. He was an immigrant from uh, Russia, fought in both world wars. Alakine was beaten by Max Uwe, but won the title back two years later. Max Uwe, the only Dutch world chess champion. Alakine died while sitting as the world chess champion, leading to a tournament organized with five players which would determine the world, the next uh, sitting world chess champion. And that tournament was won by Mikhail Botvinnik. Botvinnik played three times against Smyslov, losing his second match, but regaining the title after that. Vesely Smyslov, world chess champion. After Botvinnik took the title back, he lost in 1960 to the Wizard of Riga, Mikhail Tal, who lost the return match only one year later. Botvinnik lost for a third and final time against Tigran Petrosian, the Armenian uh, Grandmaster and super uh, legend of prophylaxis. Petrosian um, uh, defended his championship once versus Spassky, but then lost it. Boris Spassky, the darling of the Russian uh, Chess Federation in his era. And today we go on to Robert James Fisher. Four, five, six. Uh, where are we here? One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine. Um, ten. So this looks like the number eleven. Is that correct? Yes. This must be correct because after him it was Karpov, and then after Karpov it was Kasparov, and we'll look at those two guys in the next time. So today we are looking at Robert James Fisher, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, come on, Max. Don't even start with Geary. I'm not even going to look at that comment. I'm not going to even look at that comment. Okay. So Robert James Fisher, uh, the first and only official American world chess champion. At the time, uh, Bobby Fisher was already a renowned grandmaster. Famous. Um, this was at the height of the Cold War. Fisher learned how to play when he was like six years old or something. They bought a toy chess set from a candy store and he started playing with his sister. His mother was also a player, uh, Regina Wender Fisher. But she was busy with nursing and taking care of uh, the kids. She was a single mother and so Fisher was left to play alone where he would play equally as strong from both sides of the board trying to, trying to compete against himself. And this is how he started his original chess career. Um, Bobby Fischer's father, according to his birth certificate, was um, a gentleman named, um, uh, geez. Oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank here, guys. Um, Hans Gerhard Fischer. However, subsequent evaluation has shown that it was much more likely that his father was actually Hungarian Jewish mathematician and um, postulator of fluid dynamic theories, Paul Nemeny. And if you look at Paul Nemeny, you can certainly see a resemblance. 
Not only was there known to be an affair between him and Bobby Fischer's mother in 1942, but at one point in time, Paul Nemini was actually paying child support and had contacted the authorities about the way that Regina was raising, quote unquote, his son. So it, it's funny that Bobby Fischer would turn out to be this um, uh, self-loathing Jew that he turned into later. His mother also was of Jewish na uh, nationality. Both of her parents were Polish Jews. So Bobby Fischer learned how to play chess at a young age, by himself, without chess coaches, became incredibly strong at a young age, played the famous game of the century against Donald Byrne in, at the age of 13, and by the age of 15, he was the youngest grandmaster um, in the history of the United States, in fact, in the history of the world, and also the youngest world championship qualifier. He was already exhibiting signs of mental health issues over the years, and in fact, he only was invited to the inner zonal where he uh, qualified for the 1972 uh, championship because Pal Benko gave up his position in order so that uh, Fisher could take it. And in fact, another fact that most people aren't aware of is there was another grandmaster named Lombardi. And William Lombardi actually was second in line behind Pal Benko. So not only did Pal Benko have to give up his spot, but also William Lombardi had to give up his spot, allowing Fisher, the third candidate, to qualify and play in the inner zonal, and then he went on to the candidate matches from them. From there, another interesting uh, fact you should know about William Lombardi is that he was uh, Bobby Fischer's one and only second. Um, a second is a term for a grandmaster that helps you with your analysis. This was in the age before the computers, by the way. And that was, um, and after a falling out with Larry Evans, um, Fischer hired William Lombardi to be his second. And a lot of people contribute. Uh, um, uh, or a lot of people say that um, William Lombardi was instrumental in keeping Fisher's temperament uh, solid and keep and con cons like constantly making him feel good about himself and convincing him to stick around and finish this match. So had it not been for William Lombardi, it is almost certain that this match would have never taken place. But it did in 1972 in Reykjavik, I believe it was July and September 1972. In the end, Bobby Fischer won, although there was great controversy, and you can read all about this, guys. I'm not going to get into all of the details. How he, how he uh, lost the first game and then forfeited the second one. Henry Kissinger had to convince him to stay and come back for the third game, which he only agreed to as long as they wouldn't play in the regular playing hall. There was some talk about collusion with the Russians and blah, blah, blah. In the end, Fischer dominated, especially the first half of the match. He ended up with a score of, I think, 7-3 and three with some draws. with 7-3 uh, um, and three with uh, 14 draws, I think, something like that. But keep in mind that one of those losses was the forfeit loss. So he completely dominated once he came back with a score of 7-1 and 14 to become the 11th world chess champion. Um, there were obviously some troubles later on in his, law, in his life. He did play a rematch against Boris Spassky after coming out of um, 20 years as a hermit, as a complete recluse, to play a match in Yugoslavia. The chess was of dubious quality, but there were still some gems, so I would highly recommend taking a look at that 1992 rematch. He won that as well, and then was uh, basically forbidden from coming back to the United States under threat of arrest because there was a UN embargo and American sanctions um, against Yugoslavia at the time. He lost all of his possessions. They were held. All of his money was held in escrow in the Strait of uh, California, and uh, he never went back to America uh, again. He eventually moved to um, Iceland and passed away peacefully at the age of 64. The same number of squares on a chessboard. And ladies and gentlemen, there is your 11th world chess champion, Bobby Fischer. Very possibly the greatest chess player who ever lived. And if I could say, he was indeed uh, Quinn, very true. He was a Catholic priest, and at the time, actually, of that 1972 match, he was a priest, and he had to be given leave so that he could go and be the second for Bobby Fischer. Once again, because it was such a, a critical match, and you can see in this one photo, you can see the throngs of people around Bobby Fischer. Um, you can see in that bottom fish, uh, picture, I believe that's actually in Reykjavik, of all the people taking photos. On the bottom left hand, uh, there's him on the talk show with Dick Cavett. And up in the top left hand side, you can see him uh, on the cover of Time Magazine. So he, he, was, uh, he was absolutely famous. Um, USCF memberships doubled in the year 1972 because of this guy. He was an absolute, he was famous. 
Um, you know, it was us versus them. It was, you know, America versus Russia, West versus East, all of these years of Soviet collusion and finally a, a legitimate American world champion contender. You know what I mean? It was a big, big deal. So I'm sure that that played a role in how William Lombardi was even able to to uh, get that leave from the priesthood so that he could go and be the second for Bobby Fischer. And and uh, they, they analyzed every game in extreme depth with no computers. And he sacrificed so much of himself so that that match could take place. He gets forgotten by, forgotten by history, but he deserves as much credit, if not more, than Pal Banco for his role in all of that. But if I can just say one more thing before we move on to game 11... I just want to say that, and I hope I can get through this, I might not be able to, but I just want to say that, um, you know, it was a little bit emotional, you know, looking at the uh, pictures of Bobby Fischer and um, remembering, remembering who he was, what he meant to chess and how influential he was to me personally and to how my life unfolded, so. He certainly missed, uh, I'll say that. Okay, we're gonna look at this game 11, guys. This is today's game. Fabiano Caruana is black now. Magnus Carlsen is white. All right, uh, D. Janel, thanks for, thanks for popping by, man. Really appreciate you. Really appreciate you stopping by and uh, appreciate the kind words. So here we have E4 again, uh, issued by Magnus Carlsen. This is the third time, I believe, where he's played um, a certain move and then taken basically a week off and then played it again. Like, take, took several days off. And I think what he's doing is he's trying to get some extra preparation work in for his, his uh, team rather than just coming right back immediately with something fresh. And so we're going to get into a Petrovs again. This time uh, he plays the much better move, knight to f3. You might remember the last game he played knight to d3. Um, Quinn says they talk about tortured genius artists. Fisher was an artist on the board. Absolutely. And his contributions to chess, I mean, Fisher actually owned the patent for Fisher random, or like not Fisher random, but for the Fisher time control which is the time control where you have a set amount of time on your clock and then every move you get a time increment added to your clock by a digital clock. That didn't exist until Bobby Fischer came up with that idea. Now that's what we all use in our standard tournaments, including the world championship that we're watching right now. He patented that idea. Like literally. Literally has a US patent for it. Um, Fischer random chess. So many uh, openings. Um, Fischer was responsible for a lot of... Um, uh, innovations. He, he basically had a line that was like a bust to the King's Gambit declined. His D6 line basically made the King's Gambit obsolete for all intents and purposes. Um, he, he, uh, he made the Poison Pawn variation viable for Black. Now it's been analyzed basically to a draw. It was thought to have been a, a loss for Black. And many other lines. So his contribution to chess was really substantial. And uh, he's, he's missed very much. Harlem Knight coming in with a host. What's up, Harlem Knight? Thank you so kindly. Welcome, welcome to the Trout Show. I don't have my Harlem uh, mug right now. I should really, like, have it just, like, sitting out. Just, like, on, uh, like, if nothing else, for an ornament. Or, like, put a picture up of it or something. Harlem Knight. Excellent, excellent streamer. He might be doing an auto host there. I don't know if he's actually physically here. So D6, Knight to F3, Knight takes, and Knight to C3. We saw this line in the Sinkfeld Cup. Knight takes, Pawn takes... Bishop, Bishop to e3, castles. And here, this time, Carlsen plays the, the regular line. At the Sinkfeld Cup, we saw him issue the uh, move, um, or essay the move, um, Bishop to c4. It was, it was a little bit unusual to commit your bishop that early. The reason why he does that is because if you play queen here, there's a possible line of bishop to e6, castles. Um, whoops, where are we here? I think, uh, I think knight to c6 was more common. Bishop to here, bishop to e6, castles, and then queen to d6, allowing uh, black the right to castle on the queen side. I think that's the reason why anyways, but definitely that concept of like the bishop coming to e6 is a possibility, which is why um, 
in the last time in the Sinkfield Cup, which is also a draw. He tried the move uh, bishop to c4. If now, for example, knight to here and queen to d2. Now on the move, knight to d5. If knight takes and pawn takes and castles, there's some question as to whether these bishops can start attacking on the uh, queen side. Possibly an f4 and maybe the fact that there's this sort of temporary like lack of development for black. Maybe there's some little subtle ways that white can manipulate that and try to take advantage of that. Um, it should also be pointed out that in the line after um, queen to d2, I think it was actually knight to c6 though. I think it was this line here where Fabi played this against Karyakin. And let's say castles, queen, um... I don't really remember exactly how it went, but it was something like this. Um, here, 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 rook g8. Um, Probably I missed this at some point in time. I think it was something like this happened. Some kind of crap like this happened or something. Anyways, there was some kind of a line like this. Anyways, uh, what happened was Fabi made a number of blunders and got rolled off of the board. And I think that was his only last, his only loss in the candidates tournament which he won, which gave him the right to play Magnus Carlsen in this tournament. So I think those, I think both of those experiences affected both players uniquely. The loss to Karyakin for Fabi and the draw line and Bishop to C4 for Carlsen. And so they played this line slightly different. So in this line, Black castles early, Queen to D2, and then here he plays this move Knight to uh, D7. So this is already a little bit of a unique uh, line. So now he's got both knight to d5 and knight c5. He also has knight to f6 if he wants to. So there's a lot of different opportunities. Hey, calculated chess, what's up? All right, Spari, have a good night's sleep, man. Well, uh, thanks uh, for joining me, I really appreciate that. And uh, let me know next time you guys are on, uh, maybe uh, we can get some games with uh, you and Max, it'd be a lot of fun to watch. We could even have you guys play like on the side and then I could just like, analyze and uh, watch the games live while you guys are playing on my stream. That'll be kind of fun. Calculated Chess is sporting a Trout merch mug. And if you go to my Discord, you can see pictures of it. And there it is. Yeah, no problem, Sparry. I, I, I get it. You're, you're, you're way, way off uh, uh, our time over there in Holland. So uh, I really appreciate you hanging around as long as you did. Pleasure to have you. You guys are watching The Trout Show. We're taking a look at game number 11, the World Chess Championship. So white still castles. We've got opposite colored castling, but I mean, you would like to believe that this is exciting, but it's not. Basically, there's no pawns in the center. Everybody knows you're supposed to put your pawns in the center of a board, especially in a quote unquote classical or open position, as in an E4 and E5. But this is why Fabi likes this line. It leads to a lot of peace play. All of his pawns are back on the first three rows, the second and third row, like like per, per normal. Very Fabi style play. Boring. Boring, folks. <laughs> I'm so glad you have that mug. It really is good quality, though. I like that. Uh, I love that 15 ounce mug a lot. So, bishop to d3, uh, c5, rook, um, bishop to e6. Um, king over, queen a5, c5. Um, if there was something really exciting here happening, guys, I would let you know about it. But there's not. Queen takes, bishop takes, uh, h6. Oh, so this is the first kind of an interesting plan. I'm not sure if Fabi was thinking that the knight was coming to f4. Um, and maybe that move is playable.
maybe that move is playable, but maybe like just black has the extra option of bishop to f8. So I prefer what uh, what he actually did here. He plays knight to g6. This is a recurring strategic mo uh, tactical motif, guys. So it's just another way to take advantage of the f7 pawn. We all know that these two pawns are very weak at the start of a game. They're not easy pawns to defend. At the start of the game, they're only defended by your king. So sometimes you get situations where you have like a bishop on this line and you stick a knight there. Or sometimes you have a situation where there's a pawn on g6 and there's a bishop on this line and you can capture the pawn on g6 because of the pin. But in this line, he's just simply taking advantage of the fact that if the pawn takes here like this, then you're going to have this rook takes um, uh, e6. And then also there's the possibility of uh, taking here. Even if this pawn were to move forward, then the bishop is still going to come to you g6. Once again, taking advantage of the, the missing f pawn. So now on this line, if bishop to f8, I can still capture it. So I'm going to get a, a bishop out of this deal. Um, knight takes and uh, rook takes... Like maybe, um, maybe it was possible to play this move first, knight to g4. But again, I think this move is coming up. And now it feels like it's more powerful. Can he still just play here? Maybe he just transposes. No, oh, maybe it's just gonna transpose, but anyways. So knight takes, rook takes, uh, rook to e2, just simply guarding his f-pawn. So we're going to get knight to uh, e5. Typical play by Fabi, keeping everything light. He does have now this c-pawn, but I don't really think that's a good break right now. I don't think black wants to break open this position exactly at this point in time. If you played here, he might even be able to play b5. So bishop to f5, knight takes and rook takes. Um, if bishop takes here now, I've got rook takes. So rook moves over to guard this pawn temporarily. Rook takes, rook takes, bishop takes. Um, bi uh, oh, so he, he does play rook to d8 uh, first. That's a clever move because there's a checkmate coming on d1, so it forces the rook over. Now on bishop takes uh, pawn, um, uh, the king moves over. The reason is so that he can take the c pawn, but he's not going to get that chance because of b6. It's a little bit sterile, guys. Um, one important thing to notice here, though, in this position is, let's even say, like, um, so bishop there, king to there. Right, so one important thing that you want to notice here, this is a little trick, guys. These guys would never fall for this, but this is something for some of you who are maybe a little bit lower rated. You might wonder in this position, what happens if bishop takes pot? Now, if the bishop takes the pawn, you might have seen far enough, or you may not have, that the move b3 is quite dangerous, trapping the bishop like this. Okay, so you want to be careful of that. However, in this particular position, there's also the possibility of the c-pawn push. So, for example, if here and then pawn takes and pawn takes, now all of a sudden my bishop is getting out. See that? So even if you were strong enough to notice that after, whoops, after bishop takes b3, you might have thought I can get away with this because of the move c4. So here's a clever little trick that you should know, and this is just a general rule of thumb. Anytime you have a situation like this where the person has three pawns side by side and you're going to yoink one in the corner, you have to be careful of this kind of a trick. <laughs> yeah, Max says, I don't really have a comment for this game, honestly, contained start to finish. White got absolutely nothing out of this. Fabi was in total control. But then again, Magnus was never in any danger either. Okay, so if bishop takes b3, c4, king to c3, pawn takes, here's the trick, guys. You don't take the pawn. You play king to b2. A critical move. If this bishop wasn't here, it wouldn't really work. Because now after pawn takes, you wouldn't be able to take the bishop because the pawn would queen. But in this line... That square is covered by the bishop, and that's the reason why this line doesn't work for black. Now on the next move, um, no matter what black plays, we're just going to simply take here, and then this bishop is trapped. So that's that's a cute little trick that's really worthwhile to, to remember. And always something you should, red flag should be going off if you're ever thinking of stealing a little pawn in the corner like that. Same kind of thing can happen if you have like a knight here. 
and you're attacking a couple of pawns like that. You want to watch out for a move like c3, where after knight takes the pawn, um, the knight can't extract itself anymore to this square on b4 because now there's a pawn on c3. And you can't take the c3 pawn because it's carded by the b2 pawn. So if you don't have any, any other parameters, any other pieces to defend your knight, the king's just going to walk over and steal your, your knight. So you want to be very, very, very careful about using a minor piece to take a corner pawn like that when there's three pawns side by side. A little, a little uh, small little uh, trick that's uh, worth remembering. Hey, Fruit Chess is in the house. Fruit Chess is in the house, ladies and gentlemen, fellow streamer. Do I have a Fruit Chess command? Do I have a Fruit Chess command? Oh, come on, guys. Come on. Who's out there that can give me a Ferd chess command? We, really, we should have a calculated chess command too. You know, the regulars should have commands because they command respect. That's why they should have a command. In fact, that's the Ginger 64 command. <laughs> that's the Ginger 64 command. Where are we here? Even though he's not in the chat, we'll shout him out just for fun. Ginger 64. The Ginger deserves a command. The Ginger commands respect, and that's why we gave him a command. There you go. Uh, you want a quote calculated? We can do that for you. Uh, after this game, remind me again, and we're going to put in a quote for you. I'll put it in live, and then we'll get you in for that. If you have a certain quote that you like. Okay, so the game finishes off, folks. Um, A6, uh, A3. Um, now, if, for example, like A3 or something, after pawn takes and pawn here, and pawn here, king here, can he play this? No, it's the same kind of a thing. So he didn't have to play a3. I think a3 is maybe just to prevent that pawn from coming up. I was just curious whether that had, had changed that, but it doesn't. So the king comes over, bishop, pawn push, bishop, uh, bishop takes pawn. You might wonder why did he do this uh, line of moves? Because the bishop was threatening to come to b8. And so let's say, for example, um, you know, let's say you just played here first. Now after bishop to here and pawn to here and bishop to here, then you can see that this pawn is hanging. Same thing if you would have done uh, a5. So he's gonna get that pawn anyways. So black has problems on these pawns, but because we're in opposite colored bishops, opposite colored bishops is notoriously drawn. It's not always the case, but generally it is. The reason is because the, the bishops can never oppose each other. They're on opposite colors and they'll be like that forever. So all you have to do is put your pawns on the opposite color of the, the guy's bishop, and then just keep a bishop on a long diagonal, and that's basically the end of the game. You can shuffle back and forth with the bishops, and they'll never oppose each other. So, um, I don't really think that there's anything uh, that could be done about this move. C5 is gonna drop anyways, after bishop here and, uh, and bishop to B6. So there wasn't a rush, the king over bishop, excuse me, bishop check. So black's gotten a number of um, uh, moves towards the center in exchange for this. I probably would have just jumped into the center. And just out of curiosity, let's see if the uh, computer thinks anything less of this. Uh, now we've got this problem. I see, I didn't even think about that one. So we got the same problem on the other side of the board. So that's the reason probably why he's playing this move h5. He's already starting up. He's like, you know what? I'm just gonna put all my pawns on white pieces and I'm just gonna shuffle back and forth and this game's gonna be a drop. Now here's how you make a win in a position like this. If you're trying to win an opposite colored bishops ending, you have to create two passed pawns. Two, not one, but two. Even if those pawns are side by side, it's not really clear that you're winning. You can sometimes be down two, even three pawns in an opposite colored bishops and still not be able to win. It is very, very difficult. If you can create two passed pawns, you can try to make a situation where the opponent's bishop is trying to cover both pawns on opposite sides of the board at the same time and you can sort of like freeze it. You can kind of create a zigzag position. And that's what Magnus is gonna to try to do here, even though it doesn't work out. So the king moves forward, uh, the king up, king up. Now here's that final pawn on the white square. You see every single one of them. Now on a square that cannot be attacked by the bishop. You might wonder why um, white doesn't just, uh, black doesn't just play something like this. Very easy to move the pawn forward. Whoops, let's turn the computer off. And you see that the evaluation is still saying that white has a small plus. This is your typical computer not understanding what's happening in an endgame position. The computer is wrong, it's a dead draw. And it was throughout the entire endgame. But Magnus makes some uh, interesting attempts to try to get the win that were never gonna work, but they're instructive. 
So once again, putting the uh, pieces as much as possible on the black squares. Um, this move is a little bit strange. I'm a little surprised he played this move. Not really sure why he chose that particular uh, line. Maybe he was hoping to play here and then get a pawn on. I'm, I'm not really sure what he was trying to do. So the bishop attacks it. Um, king to d3, that's a clever move. It's better than c3. Doesn't block the pawn, takes away the e2 square. Bishop, pawn. Bishop, king up. Pawn takes, pawn takes. So boom, there's one. We created one pass pawn. Now he's going to have to try to create a second one. That's not going to be so easy. Bishop, the pawn pushes. So now he's got that pawn far advanced on a dark square. Uh, four pawns and still uh, uh, drawn. Says uh, Max. Uh, Max says the top seed was up like four pawns and got tricked into a draw opposite, uh, drawn opposite bishop's ending with uh, stalemate. Uh, this was at the junior championships. Really, eh? Wow. Boy, I'd like to see that game, Max. If you can find that, send a DM to me. That would be a lot of fun to take a look at. Wow. Yeah, they're tough, man. They're notoriously tough. Here, Magnus is only up one pawn. So he does have his one pass pawn, and he does have an active king. So he's going to try to just kind of keep this wall out for this king and start trying to move his king over towards this side of the board. And then he's going to shoot up his F and uh, H pawns. And you'll see how this plays out. Um, so he's just going to remaneuver the bishop. So that's going to allow his bishop to uh, protect the pawn from behind. So now the king's uh, going to move forward. Um, he might be hoping to try to trick him into playing f6 here or something, but I don't really see it making any difference. Um, maybe hoping for this and this and then king here. Okay, so g4. Number one. Boom, boom. So he's taken away the g-pawn. Now here's the thing, he has two pawn levers. He has a lever on f5 and he has a lever on h5. So his goal is he's going to try to shoot his pawn up to f5, try to force a capture, and then push his h pawn. So that way, this bishop is going to be tied down to two different things, trying to protect two different pawns. Uh, if the king comes in and just guards the pawn, the pawn's going to go forward and he's going to have to sack his bishop. That'll be a dead loss. And if the king moves away, then this pawn is going to come forward, and so the bishop is going to get overworked. It's not going to be able to guard both uh, pawn promotion threats. So that's Magnus' plan. So the bishop back. Now he's just going to go into shuffle mode here, Fabby. Um, boom, there's your h5. Boom, there's your, uh, or your h4, and then there's your f4. So we're basically like in as good of a position as white can hope for. Uh, the bishop back. Um, um, the king forward. I'm not really sure what the exact... Maybe the idea is just to try to stop the king from coming into you. Uh, d7 and coming around this way. So he's still eyeing this pawn. Black has to continue to shuffle. Uh, pawn. And now finally he pushes this f pawn. If white, if black takes this, then the pawn pushes. And I think that this is going to be a win. In fact, maybe even before that, it might even be better to play bishop to here. And then this pawn is just going to um, walk on up. Bishop, if bishop to here now. Pawn, bishop, pawn, bishop, and it's just too fast. Okay. So that's kind of what he's hoping for. Instead, uh, black plays this beautiful move. Bishop to uh, b1, very instructive. Um, uh, if the pawn takes here, then we're going to get uh, bishop takes pawn, and this pawn will never be able to maneuver there. You can try king here with the threat of the pawn push. But once again, the rook is just going to move away. And so this this, pawn, this king can never be dislodged on the white square. And this bishop can never be dislodged from its long row of uh, possible squares. And the pawn can't push. And if um, pawn takes... Wait, hold on. Bishop to there. Um, if pawn takes, then we're also going to do pawn takes. And once again, we have this long row of squares. So there's really nothing for white to do. He shuffles his bishop, and black is going to shuffle as well. And that's the end of that game. He's not able to force the capture, and therefore it's going to be a draw. So that was your game 11 of the World Chess Championships. We have 11 games played. We have 11 draws. Uh, tomorrow will be the final game at regulation time controls. Fabiana will have white, as he had in the first game, because of the crossover colors in the middle. 
Carlson had two whites in a row, couldn't capitalize. We'll see if Fabi is content to play for a draw or if he goes for the gun.